ladies and gentlemen, excellencies and others. We have all been carrying for the past day uh, this uh, JESTA breakthrough radar, one kilo of possible scientific breakthroughs that could impact us greatly. For those who were here on time for the past uh, uh, quarter hour, you have seen the strong statements that the multilateral community has made on the right to benefit from the advancement of science in, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the Covenant of Economic and Social Rights. The right for all to benefit from the progress of science. This resonates, of course, deeply with our anticipation efforts. We want science to be there for the good of all. The texts are beautiful, but are they being used? Does this human right to science have an impact nationally or inter and internationally? Do we even know its implications? In this session, we will dig deep in two, part, in two parts. First, you will have class. You'll go back to master class. And then we will discuss with the roundtable participants, which I will introduce in due time. And then, if time permits, one hour sharp, we'll also discuss with you. The piece de resistance of the class, of the learning segment, is the master class that will be delivered by Professor Samantha Besson. So, but don't worry, two years of master studies are condensed into 15 minutes. So, Professor Samantha Besson is a leading scholar in international, public international law. She was born in Beirut and comes also from the Canton de Vaud. She holds the chair Droit International des Institutions at the Collège de France and is also a professor at the University of Fribourg. Her inaugural lesson at the Collège de France was entitled Reconstructing the international institutional order, which should certainly be of interest of all of us. She was the very first delegate for human rights at the Swiss Academies of Sciences, and she kindled just as interest for these human rights. She's also, and we are happy, she's also a board member of JESTA. So please uh, welcome Professor Samantha Besson. Fasten your seatbelts, it's class time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you so much, Gerard, for the kind words. Um, when I was asked to um, talk to you today, I thought it would be interesting to discuss anticipation under the human right to participate in science. So let me bring you first through an outline. This is what I plan to do with you. Um, this morning. First, give you uh, a couple of details and information about the concepts that are used in this title. Anticipation first, um, and then the human right to participate in science, and then briefly cover the stakes. And then I'll go through um, those um, three other points here on the screen. So, let me start with concepts and stakes. So, Gérard, in his introduction, and the panel in general, uses the term human right to science. But as you may have noticed in my title, uh, I decided to refer to it as the human right to participate in science. And the reason is um, that I think this title, the human right to participate in science, is more faithful to the origins of the right in Article 27, Paragraph 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It originates, indeed, in the post-war belief that science should be guaranteed as an independent, participatory good with a strong institutional and normative structure. Of course, as we all know, amidst the Cold War and with the individualization of science, the human right to participate in science lost its participatory dimension in the Covenant on Economic and Social Rights to become a purely passive right to enjoy scientific benefits 
Hence, the sadly inadequate term that we use today, the human right to science. The right, then, that was stripped of any social and participatory teeth became dormant, or more exactly, having been stripped of its participatory and social teeth, was put to sleep. Today, as Gérard mentioned before, we're trying to reinvigorate the right. And when doing so, we should aim, I think, at renewing with a post-war consensus on the public and participatory good of science. And this in reaction to the growing individualization, instrumentalization, and privatization of science. But also in reaction to a well-known scientist's counter-reaction every time has been instrumentalized in the course of history. Every time science is under threat of the market or the state, then scientists tend to isolate and self-validate. So that's for the first term. The second term, anticipation. As we all know, Ulrich Bex um, coined the term risk society. It then became, in different languages, vigilant society, and it has now turned into what one may describe as the anticipation society. We all rally here under the term anticipation. In short, the point of anticipation turned into an imperative and a concern is to foresee and control as much as possible potential harms to come and to do so by identifying the risks of such harms, managing and containing them, and even accounting for not doing so. The law, including international law, has been deeply affected by the de development of the anticipation concern. It has actually also contributed to its development in return, its fueling anticipation. This has given rise to a more future-oriented approach to time in the law, and I suppose all lawyers in the room can attest to that. This is what explains the emergence of new legal concepts, such as, as intergenerational rights, sustainability, but also the consolidation of new duties and principles of prevention and precaution, and the renaissance of the standard of due diligence lately. There is, of course, no time to address those concepts in full here, but I will shortly explain the two principles and corresponding duties of precaution and prevention, and the standard of due diligence that qualifies them. Those are the three panels of the anticipation triptych, as it were. So let me start with the first panel of the anticipation triptych, the principle and corresponding duty of precaution. That principle and corresponding duty requires, in short, the adoption of measures of avoidance, or at least of mitigation of risks of serious and irreversible harm, and this even when under the current state of scientific knowledge, the occurrence of that harm is probable but uncertain. The duty of precaution's relationship to the second panel in the anticipation triptych, i.e. the principle and corresponding duty of prevention, is progressive and it evolves with the evolution of scientific knowledge. Indeed, once the risk of harm goes from uncertain to certain scientifically, the principle of precaution becomes one of prevention and a duty of prevention arises. The duties of precaution and prevention are positive duties of conduct by opposition to duties of result. Indeed, duty bearers are not expected to guarantee the absence of harm, but only to do their best to avoid the harm or mitigate the risk in concrete circumstances. Now, the assessment of what amounts to the duty bearer's best effort in each case is absolutely key. And it's at this point that the third and central panel in the anticipation triptych, the standard of due diligence, enters the scene. This standard of conduct is engrafted upon and qualifies the duties of precaution and prevention I've just presented. Due diligence requires reasonable care or diligence in precaution or prevention. The duties of precaution or prevention are breached in case of unreasonable or undue negligence. The standard of due diligence is violated if two conditions are fulfilled, forcibility of the harm, the duty bearer knew or should have known about the risk of harm, and the ability to prevent or protect against it i.e. the duty bearer had the capacity to do something about their risk. 
Now, you may have noticed that this diligence is qualified as being due or reasonable. And the foreseeability and ability conditions I've just described are qualified as reasonable as well, to the extent that they only amount to what a reasonable person, here the reasonable state, could foresee and was able to do. And they also adapted to the specific conditions of the state and need to be contextualized in each case. So that was a very fast paced visit um, across the three panels of the anticipation triptych. And I hope this helps clarify what we mean here by anticipation. So now the stakes. Let us make no mistake. There are enough contemporary threats to address under the human rights to participate in science. We will be discussing some of those contemporary threats later this morning, open access, equal access, academic freedom, data sharing, participatory science, indigenous knowledge. Those are very important concerns and they happen right now. But to the extent that JESDA's focus is on anticipation, anticipation of the science in the making and of the science to come, it's interesting for us to explore anticipation under the human right to participate in science in the context of plans to reinvigorate the right. So, before addressing what the human right to participate in science can bring to anticipation, let me just say a few words about anticipation, the adver adverse effects of science generally. It is, first of all, we should say, a very old concern. It's been formulated in various declarations and statements by the UN General Assembly and UNESCO since the 1970s. I won't go into the detail here. And it's been triggered by a couple of realizations. First, the disjunction in practice of moral social progress from scientific progress. It's also been triggered by the realization that science may be put to dual use and finally, um, that science may also be abused. Uh, obviously, example of dual use is nuclear energy, energy but uh, examples of abuse of science would be biological racism. And of course, it's also been triggered by the realization that still applies today, that science may be instrumentalized politically and legally. Here it suffices to think of scientific socialism or of Third Reich's biological laws. But it is also, as we all know, and this is why we're here today, a renewed and more pressing concerns because of changes in the spatial and temporal framework of science. And I'll only mention a few here. First, the pace. Science is developing fast and high-risk science is developing very fast with new and emerging science actually merging. The impact over time has changed as well. The, the consequences of science are now more lasting that will last over generations. And sometimes they are irreversible. It suffices to think of genetic engineering, but also geo and bioengineering, which are concerns of JESDA. Thirdly, the scale of science is globalized and so have its effects. Fourthly, there is what one may call today scientific polychrony. Science is globalized, science is privatized, and as a, as a result, the pace of scientific development is different across the globe and across public and private science. And finally, science is still at risk of instrumentalization, but there's also um, a new risk, which is political and legal scientism and the increasing role of science in the law. Legal norms are more and more replaced by scientific norms and international human rights law is actually at risk. For those of us who are deeply immersed in international human rights law, if you look carefully at the language that's been used in recent years, we see terms such as human species used much more often than terms such as human persons. And, you know, I could, you know, give many, many other examples of this risk of scientism, including in international human rights law. So let's move now to anticipation and anticipating the beneficial and adverse effects of science under the human right to participate in science. You've noticed that the previous title was anticipating the adverse effects of science in general, whereas this title says anticipating the beneficial and adverse effects of science under the human right to participate in science. Now the first reaction, and it's 
an absolutely right reaction, is to say, well, you know, we've had anticipation duties and responsibilities pertaining to the risk of harm triggered by science for a long time in international law. We've had such duties under international environmental law, for, for, for instance, but we've also had it, and we have experts in the room, under international biomedical law for many, many decades. We've had it as well, more and more, under international human rights law through the justified restrictions of the human right to participate in science in case of conflicts with other human rights. The human right to participate in science may conflict with the right to life, the right to health, the right to a healthy environment. And in those cases, um, anticipation duties regarding the adverse effects of science will arise under those other human rights. And they will be perfectly uh, regular anticipation duties of the kind we know in human rights law. But what I'd like to stress here is by contrast to those existing duties of anticipation of the adverse effects of science that we know under other human rights and the limits to the human rights to participate in science that they justify in case of conflicts of rights, the anticipation duties that arise under the human right to participate in science that we've not actually tanked over and exploited sufficiently yet are not only instrumental to the protection of other human rights. The risk of harm at stake, indeed, does not only pertain to the harm to the another interest or another right, but the risk of harm is a risk of harm to the good of science itself, and hence becomes one of the interests protected by the human right to participate in science itself. To that extent, anticipating such harms is one of the objects of the human right to participate in science and one of its corresponding duties. So that's a very important specificity. There are three additional specific contributions of the human right to participate in science to the anticipation of the harms caused by science. The first one is its positive-negative dualism. The first universal declaration of the human right to participate in science in 48 was as much a recognition of the existence of a fundamental and equal interest of all human beings in certain kind of science as it was a recognition of the vulnerability of that interest and of its need of protection against other kinds of science. Accordingly, anticipation duties under the human right to participate in science are both duties to anticipate and promote the beneficial aspects of science and duties to prevent and protect against the adverse effects of science. So what this means is that by contrast to what is the case under other human rights, where anticipation usually fuels fear and control, here anticipation is not only negative and harm-oriented, it is both positive and negative at the same time. And what ma matters is reaching a balance between the potential beneficial and adverse effects when specifying the content of the human right to participate in science. A second very interesting feature of the human right to participate in science is its participatory dimension. The right protects a participatory good and individual and collective interest in that participation. To that extent, it implies organizing equal public participation in science over the beneficial and adversarial effects of science. And this participatory dimension of the right requires transparency on all questions, hopefully securing more overall predictability in science. Here I would like to mention the citizen juries on genome editing, which is a beautiful way of organizing participation on the beneficial and adversarial effects of science. A third and very interesting related interesting feature of the human right to science for anticipation purposes is its communal dimension. The human right to, to participate in science is not only related to public good, it's related to communal good. Communal literally means in the communal responsibility. It's a communal concern. It's a responsibility of all of us. As a result, the responsibility for anticipation does not only weigh on the shoulders of institutional duty bearers such as the states, but it also bears on all the members of the epistemic community's shoulders. Um, scientists, of course, uh, but also all of us. So what's particularly important 
is that it would be a mistake under the human right to participate in science to leave anticipation either to public authorities or to the scientists in the name of expertise or scientific complexity. It has to be dealt with by both groups at the same time. And finally and quickly, I'd like to go over two missed opportunities of the human right to participate in science. At the moment, when scholars are looking into reinvigorating anticipation under the human right to participate in science, they usually throw themselves into the arms and the, into the arms, sorry, of um, the classical anticipation anticipation duties under international environmental law or international biomedical law. So they will precipitate themselves into the usual quantification of anticipation, the instrumental cost-benefit approach to the corresponding duties. So they will move into maximization of benefit, minimization of harm. This is not only a catastrophe for human rights because it treats ends as means, but it's a catastrophe for science because it entrenches a predominantly instrumental approach to science, treating science as an end product rather than as a process. And the second missed opportunity which matters very much to me is that scholars tend to throw themselves into the arms of anticipatory technoscience and the self-validating scientific approach to anticipation duties. As mentioned before, the anticipation triptych, precaution, prevention, due diligence, is dominated by tests of certainty and forcibility based on the state of scientific knowledge. And it's of course easy to understand why this kind of approach is so attractive. It proceduralizes, it technicizes, it makes it seem as if it's all more objective and universal. But there's something lost in international human rights law by doing so, and there's something lost in science. Let me say what it is, and this will be my conclusion. By applying an approach based on scientific predictability to the anticipation of the beneficial and adverse effects of science, anticipation becomes circular. You can't address scientific, you can't address scientific harms by using a scientific method. This leads us straight into the kind of scientific self-validation that was criticized by Robert Merton more than 80 years ago. So yet again, on the brink of very dangerous technologies, science, or a certain predominant science at least, is in a position to determine its own ends and value with the complicity of human rights lawyers. This is very serious and I mark my words. Going down this path risks undermining the whole purpose of having an independent guarantee of science under international human rights law. And there's much more that we can discuss, which I've left for discussion. The need to discuss intergenerational anticipation and the need to discuss international institutions for anticipation. Luckily, just does organizing a workshop on this, and there will be results that we'll be soon sharing with you. So thank you so much for organizing me, um, and I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we, we sh maybe we should have shortened it to one year, not to 15 minutes. Very rich contribution. But I will now say the human right to participate in science, which seems a very important uh, line that we should not forget. To give you time to digest this very rich uh, input, we will have now a little video in color. And it's a recorded statement by the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, uh, Gabriela Ramos. UNESCO is, of course, one of the agencies in charge of the human right to participate in science, if, my, if I may express this very slowly. Unfortunately, UNESCO has, at the same time than we have our summit, their executive committee, and so Gabriela Ramos could not attend in person. So we have a five-minute uh, color video with the input from an important agency for the reviving of this human right. I'm delighted to contribute to your deliberations on reviving the right to science. And I would like to thank Geza for the invitation. 
Despite the extraordinary progress in all fields of science, we are far from being able to consider it a right. The right to do science, the right to benefit from science. Many of the new and persisting challenges are human rights issues. For instance, Scientific freedom faces increasing obstacles with 332 attacks on higher education documented in 2021 alone. This was done by scholars at risk. Access to scientific benefits also remains highly unequal. As of April, 72% of, of people living in high-income countries have been vaccinated against COVID-19, compared to 15.2% in low-income countries. And I'm just talking about one dose. Trust in science is being eroded by disinformation and misinformation, spreading through the digital world, but also fueled by rampant populism. In a Global Peer survey conducted before the COVID-19 pandemic, 17% of the people that answer responded that they do not trust science, not too much, not at all. And this is a problem. In Central African countries, trust in science was barely 48% of those surveyed. The internet divide persists, impacting on access to vital information. 96% of the almost 3 billion people who do not have access to internet live in developing countries. And what about gender? Gender disparities remain deeply, deeply rooted. Women are significantly underrepresented, for example, in the STEM community with only 28% of STEM uh, uh, professionals and only 22% in artificial intelligence. Leadership positions are particularly hard to reach for women, and this continues for decades. At the same time, we have good news. Today, we have a stronger normative framework, and we are proud of the central role of UNESCO instrument in expanding protection. Our 2017 recommendation on science and scientific research pushes us to go beyond economic growth or innovation as the traditional framework and to link scientific advancement and innovation with the well-being of our society's more marginalized segments. And all of that in an environment where policymaking is informed by sciences and science and scientists that, that really are working with a lot of interfer interference. Our 2021 recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence is also contributing to this environment of open science, of trust in science, cracking the algorithm for greater equality and social justice in these technologies, and also putting gender equality at the center, featuringly prominently. Moreover, we have more robust operational guidance as a fast expanding literature. So we need to move more decisively towards anchoring science in human rights, building on this positive momentum. In particular, we need our members to be accountable. They need to deliver on what they sign. And this recommendation, the 2017 recommendation, has a very strong monitoring system. And we will be promoting uh, this strong monitoring to advance better understanding of scientific freedom and to put this issue in the radar of, of governments, of, uh, of stakeholders, uh, and, and also to be able to develop a comprehensive set of indicators and a framework to strengthen member states' compliance with international standards. We should do our utmost to raise the profile of this right. And cutting edge counting is critical. Just this week, we launched the first ever massive open online course, a MOOC, on science and human rights that I would like you to, Im to invite to explore and disseminate. Knowing about the right to science is an absolute prerequisite to be able to promote it and defend it. Let's join, join forces on that. And we absolutely must redress gender inequalities. Hence our project on Women for Ethical Artificial Intelligence, which addresses inequalities of access, representation, 
and leadership in AI development are used, and it also counters gender biases and prejudices in AI datasets, and count on women to advance in a fairer and, and free uh, world of AI. Finally, we must expand alliances. We know there are many people that share our certain concerns and share our, our, our same beliefs. So we need the human rights communities to embrace the raised right to science, as it has done with all other rights. And we need the scientific community to open up the world of legal obligations and entitlements. And that's why I'm really glad to be with Gesa, because I know I'm talking to the converters. But you need to help us really to put the right to science high in the international agenda. UNESCO is keen to work with you to create these breaches and take this agenda forward. Count on UNESCO. A recorded uh, applause. We will send, it, we send the, we will send you the applause, uh, Gabriela. And you have not finished learning. Now there is a MOOC, so please check it. May I now ask the panelists to come to the stage? And I will uh, start the discussion with the representative of uh, the second UN agency in charge of this human right, the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. Uh, I, say, I mean Alexandra Xantaki, please sit. And uh, Alexandra Xantaki is Greek, that's a quality, <laughs> and is professor uh, at Brunel University in London and a sen senior fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London too. And if two jobs were not enough, uh, Alexandra was appointed the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights one year ago. You are a leading expert on indigenous rights in international law, and we are very lucky to have you with us. So as a first question, I would like to ask you, could you uh, develop the, the challenges, uh, the work to be done that you see for the human right to participate in science in the perspective of being a special rapporteur for cultural rights. Thank you. Does this work, right? Yeah. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think that um, I am completely in sync with um, uh, Professor Besson um, about the, the challenges. Um, the uh, right to science has not been um, developed enough and certainly has not been mm implemented enough. Um, the discussions on science um, tend to um, put on the side um, the human rights framework, even though the human rights framework offers very clear dimensions and very, um, very clear directions um, uh, regarding uh, current uh, uh, crises and, and current issues we have. So, um, first of all, the as a right, it has a scope, beneficiaries and duty bearers, and in all of these, in all three of these, uh, we have uh, challenges. First of all, the scope of the right. Um, still, we focus so much on access um, to science, which of course is still an issue, but uh, we forget about the other aspects. I would defer a little bit um, from um, the Professor Besson in the sense that participation for me seems to be a little bit passive. Uh, the indigenous debate has shown us that we should be talking and local populations and now we have a declaration on uh, peasants etc um, shows to us that we have to um, focus on leading so participation consultation free prior and informed consent and um, these marginalized persons leading uh, scientific projects and we do not see this uh, not even among ourselves the panel um, and I include myself um, so um, secondly, um, it is um, um, the, the scope um, does not talk almost at all about benefit um, at the moment. There is no discussion on, on benefit. 
um, practices of expensive sub subscriptions to access peer-reviewed scientific publications make knowledge and the debate less um, accessible across the globe, and the debate is very much um, restricted to the scientific community. And even what um, what we mean by scientific community is interesting. Um, are the examples that I have heard and I very often hear um, come from very specific areas of um, um, scientific community, and there is a discussion, an ongoing discussion um, on uh, academic freedom, and I would like to learn more about how um, the, the two interact, academic freedom and scientific freedom. So the scope. The scope needs more um, discussion and elaboration. Secondly, beneficiaries. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, beneficiaries. Um, we we have put aside local indigenous populations, and when we refer to indigenous um, peoples. Uh, we make them into a sui generis uh, category. Um, very often when I ask the question, um, international organizations or states say that, oh yes, of course, we have this completely different separate um, system for indigenous peoples. And we all know that what we mean is that we are, um, states and, and international organizations are very worried about um, what they call opening the floodgates. But in international human rights law standards, we don't just talk about indigenous peoples anymore. Um, when we even when we talk about free prior informed consent, uh, we talk about local populations and, um, and others. And, and I think also um, when we talk about participation, um, the, 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 the right to participate in the science cannot be um, only focused on scientists. We have seen that unfortunately the, um, the COVID debate has shown us once, has confirmed once again how um, uh, reluctant the um, general population is to accept um, the, the, the opinions of uh, what they see as um, experts, um, who they see are separated from, from them. And something has to happen with that. So beneficiaries. And finally, duty bearers. We can talk about the states. And of course, the state should be the, um, the first call of reference. But um, we do have pharmaceutical um, organize, uh, corporations and other corporations that are becoming very powerful. And we try to avoid the, 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 the issue. And intergovernmental organizations. I mean, WIPO is still very reluctant to accept that um, uh, the human rights standards and human rights discussions, the World Bank, uh, um, I think uh, gets um, um, almost um, um, spots whenever the the word uh, human rights is is being mentioned. Um, so, so I think that at the moment these are the um, the the challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Any one of you would make a short comment to what you just heard, also from Gabriela. Otherwise, we move on. Uh, I turn to Andrea Boggio. He is a Italian, that's also a quality, and a professor of uh, legal studies at Bryant University in, in Rhode Island. Uh, and you were trained in Italy and uh, Stanford. And you are uh, what I would, and don't take it badly, an applied scholar, so you have tried to apply the human right to participate in science to uh, science being made today and uh, so my first uh, uh, question to you would be so the, um, the, um, in the real world, how were you able to, to use the human right to science framework in, in the realm of, of medicine? What, what has happened there? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and thank you for the invitation. And I hold a dual passport, so you can uh, use my American identity if you like that better. Um, I think the challenge is, uh, so I'm a legal scholar and I do work both uh, with the other legal scholars in refining the more theoretical aspects and there's still a lot of work to be done to really uh, identify the proper meaning of the words in the treaties. But there's also work to be done in translating that into um, action or um, standards that can be used in practice in science. So I'm a scholar who does science policy and in international law. Um, and so I think the challenge in part with uh, human rights is we have this ger very general and abstract language. How we translate that into something that can be meaningful to 
people in the field. Uh, human rights, just to give you an, another 30 seconds uh, uh, legal lecture, law lecture, is primarily law for the governments. Um, and so how do uh, scientists and technology developers um, engage with that? Um, and so uh, in order to trans transform, transform this um, very abstract principle into practice, uh, I think one necessary step is to identify certain standards uh, for practice. So how we move from the general to a, a lower level of uh, abstraction when we identify proper standards. So one example uh, is to think about data sharing or access to data. And I think the, the next speaker is going to talk more about scientific publications. So these are standards uh, that are more close to uh, the field. Uh, and so uh, there is uh, standards that apply to governments. And here you can look at the work done by UNESCO on so-called open science uh, and the recent recommendation on open science that uh, explicitly uh, re recommends uh, implementing programs to share data at the level of governments. Uh, but also scientists themselves can adopt some of these standards and make them their own in their practice. And I think I, I completely agree with the idea of participation as a simultaneous involvement of all the actors, scientists, governments, and society. And so here uh, you can look at uh, various programs, uh, consortia particularly of scientists, and um, um, you know has been uh, explicitly used uh, in a consortium called uh, Global uh, con, uh, Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, where the human rights to science is foundational to scientists agreeing to be part of the alliance. So it's like a club, and one of the rules for participating is the agreement to share data. Uh, so this is not for publication, this is data sharing among scientists who belong to uh, this alliance. So that's another way to uh, implement the right to science by having scientists themselves adopting some of the standards and agreeing to uh, open science in their practice of science. Uh, now, uh, will the public benefit? Uh, and so are we still uh, implementing the right to science in this broader sense? And the answer is yes, because if you share data, you will have more powerful ways to investigate the scientific questions. And so ultimately, you also serve the public. Uh, and so it's important, I think, what is interesting about the uh, Romanian right to science is uh, is able to identify standards or criteria that actually are helping the three prongs of this complex relationship all to uh, produce better science and outcomes for, for everybody. Great. Uh, any comments by the panelists? Uh, let me ask maybe uh, a, nasty, a nasty question, Andrea. You wrote uh, a paper, and I only read the title, which is something, Human Genetic Engineering is not contrary to the human right to participate in science. How did you get there? <laughs> there is also a book and a <laughs> bunch of other articles. Uh, I was uh, invited uh, by WHO at the, uh, to give a testimony, if you wish, at the, uh, for the uh, working group on gene editing. Uh, the title of the paper e, uh, is that gene editing is not against human rights law, something like that. And it's actually one of those titles that actually capture the article. You don't need to read it. <laughs> That's what we, what we say. Uh, now, the point here, I think, is uh, that there are standards, international human rights law, also to think about these questions. Uh, I can tell you what the standards are. And I think the standards are that uh, uh, the human rights to science incorporate the recognition of scientific freedom. Uh, and so that, uh, would, I would argue, it's a default of any society. We should start from recognizing scientific freedom, and then we restrict that only if there is a you know, if, if it is the case. And human rights law, I think we heard earlier in the lecture, there are some uh, clear uh, criteria for restricting scientific freedom. Uh, but I think we need to flip around the, the discourse from we need to demonstrate uh, that we can do it. Uh, but I think the default is that uh, there is scientific freedom and should restrict it when it's um, necessary. Uh, one of the mis 
misconception with gene editing, if you're interested in that, uh, is that it's prohibited by UNESCO, uh, which is not true. That's, I think, when we get in more into the detail of the paper. Uh, the uh, Declaration on um, uh, Human Rights and, and the Genome, I believe, or whatever was the title, uh, explicitly in the working, uh, in the negotiation of that declaration, they explicitly uh, wanted not to apply to gene editing. We are talking here about the germline, so modifying uh, the, the germline, therefore the genome of future generations. Uh, and so there is no explicit prohibition in international law. It doesn't mean you, you can't do it and have to do it, uh, but certainly law is not an obstacle to developing this technology. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Yep. Um, and probably... Uh, Worthy uh, next session, maybe next year uh, when we when we go to, to. So let me turn now to another person who is instrumental in giving life to the human right to participate in science, uh, Frederick uh, Fenter. Frederick is the uh, chief uh, executive editor of Frontiers, an open access publisher by, based in Lausanne, Lausanne uh, nearby. Interestingly, you studied chemistry and, uh, and conducted research in atmospheric science. So space opens, uh, opens the horizons. You oversee one of the largest open access uh, uh, publisher operations. Uh, I think uh, last time I checked, nearly 1.9 billion, billion articles were viewed or downloaded from uh, Frontiers. But you also, Frontiers is committed, a committed entity to make the right to science uh, work. So I will ask a first question, easy question. How do you link the human right participant science and your operation, the open access? How do you see this? Question? Okay, th thank you very much. I, and I just want to point out that it's a great pleasure to be here. And I've actually learned quite a bit already. The anticipatory aspect is, is actually very interesting, something that we'll, we'll absolutely pr pursue. Um, I think that there's a very simple statement, and that's that open access publishing is an integral part of the human right to participate in science. And uh, I think that it's an integral part in terms of sharing in scientific advancements and scientific benefits. Um, and there are two levels, I think. The first level is that, very simply, if somebody wants to participate in the scientific endeavor, access to the scientific literature is a prerequisite. You have to have access to the scientific literature even to get started. So there is a very, very simple response, I think. But we've all been talking about, you know, participation, broader participation. There's a second level, and that's providing access to, uh, to the public, to everybody else, to everybody else who could benefit from, 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 this, from this access. Again, very much in this uh, spirit of participation. Um, and, you know, why is that? I mean, I think COVID, we've seen with COVID why it is such a critical, it is such critical importance that we organize our scientific knowledge base so that we can move towards solutions. And we have to be thinking about startups. We have to be talking about innovators. We have to be thinking even about our schools. And if we're actually able to develop, if we're to work in terms of driving these two levels effectively, we will find solutions to these challenges more, effect uh, more quickly, better solutions. We will build trust in science. We will improve the way we educate our kids. And I think we will bring much better equity, true equity, and intellectual partnership to the, to, to the global south. Because that access to the, to, the, to, to the corpus of the scientific literature is the starting point. Um, and I think, I just want to say this was powerfully demonstrated, I think, with the CORD-19 database. Um, this is an example of how policy is actually able to have an important driving effect. The WHO, the White House, the Wellcome Trust, they got behind this idea of making a, a, um, a, a publicly available open resource around all the research that, that was done in, 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 in COVID. And this was hugely successful in terms of providing vaccines, providing uh, uh, treatments for people with, uh, with, with COVID. But as a publisher, I'd also like to point out that it was very effective in driving the way people work with, the, with, with this knowledge base. It drove techniques in text and data mining, and it drove techniques in the use of artificial intelligence in terms of extracting insights from this database that no individual human would ever have been able to, to, to derive individually. Um, we did a recent study at Frontiers 
we asked researchers working in this COVID space um, a certain number of questions, and I just want to point out two points. One, 80% responded that they agreed with the statement that open access was an accelerating factor in developing vaccines and treatments. And, um, and interestingly, we talked a little bit about access to data. Um, a majority responded that this access to the literature was actually more important for their work than access to the data itself behind the, the, the published uh, 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 articles. Now, um, we did this with COVID. I would just like to point out that there is absolutely no reason why we cannot accept that there's a climate emergency, that, that there is a cancer emergency, there's a mental health emergency. It's hard to think of an important scientific issue that does not deserve this type of organization and opening of, of, of the content. And I'm just gonna finish by saying that, um, you know, we are an open access publisher. Why do we, why do we uh, believe in this mission? I, in 1948, when Article 27 was written, uh, distribution of scientific output was done by print. It was a, uh, and, and actually getting copies, getting 1,000 copies of your work distributed to the most important research laboratories around the world was the best that could be done with the technology at that time. And copyright transfer to the publisher was actually an enabler. It allowed the publisher to do this in a very effective way and not have to worry about negotiating every time there was a change in, a, for example, a commercial strategy. But this spirit has really been locked in. And this is a very, very powerful status quo. And it is a status quo which is a relic of the print era. And we have to now move beyond that. When the internet came out almost 30 years ago, this is an affordable universal technology that changed everything. And um, it is a natural channel for the knowledge dissemination. And I see it as a great equalizer. This is access to knowledge via the internet is what's going to level the playing field in a lot of different ways. Um, so today, in the spirit of Article 24, if you have a platform to deliver, to organize scientific content, if it does not benefit from this basic foundational tool, the, the, the open access via the internet, you're getting off on the wrong foot. And, um, and I think that we, you know, we see platforms today that do require, uh, that restrict access, and, and this is an absurdity today. I think uh, um, if you're going to build a service, make sure that it is compatible with the widespread technology that would allow everybody to participate as a starting point. And, and I think I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. Sort of. There's energy there. I, I, I could. So let me uh, uh, turn to our last uh, panelist, uh, turn back to Switzerland, and uh, introduce uh, Thomas Zeltner. He is, so he has both, he's a physician and a lawyer. So both worlds. He is the former Secretary of Health of Switzerland, so our health minister has been the health minister for 18, for 18 years, for 18 years. 19. He, 19 for, uh, <laughs> it was long. Even more. <laughs> he knows, uh, he knows uh, Geneva International well. He had many influential appointments at the WHO. And uh, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you are the current chairman of the WHO Foundation. So, but today we welcome you as the president of uh, UNESCO Commission of Switzerland. And thank you for doing that too. So the, the Swiss Commission of UNESCO has had a, a, a deep work on the human right to participate in science. They have actually published a report. We will find a way to send you the link so you have something to read for the weekend. But uh, what is the, the one key message from, from this work uh, in Switzerland? Well, uh, thank you so much and very glad to be here. I mean, there are for me three key messages and uh, the Commission of UNESCO in Switzerland is here uh, to defend the content, the rights, you know, defined by UNESCO. And uh, what we realized, and that's the reason why we took it as a priority, if I ask our government are you aware that there is a human right for science? I would say, seven out of seven would say, gee, never heard of it. If we ask the parliament the same question, they would say, Hoo -hoo -hoo. But, and what's the meaning of that? And thirdly, and we need to talk about that uh, in Switzerland, given that we are a direct democracy, the general public, and we can make the test here in town, 
ask someone, have you ever heard of the uh, right to science or participate in that? They would say, never heard of it. So the, the UNESCO Commission said, that's a big problem. And we need to raise the awareness that there is something like that. And someone has told you, has told about that. We need to take this right out of his sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Because, and the first thing we need to do in that is actually to have a narrative that the government, the parliament, the population understands. Why is that actually imp important? And that's what we are right now working on. The second uh, point I want to, want to address is we just come out of this COVID pandemic, I dare saying that, and uh, we nevertheless need to take, and the government needs to take uh, the lessons learned and to change. And one of the lessons we learned is, have we been as well and as good as we could have been when it comes to applying the precautionary principle and the science behind that? Everybody in the room knows that. Switzerland was crazy enough, and I'm part of the team, to buy for 8 million Swiss people, uh, out of which six we estimated will vaccinate. We bought 35 million doses of vaccine. Crazy. And behind that is a, a, a perception. How does the government perceive precaution? And our explanation was, we don't know how much of these products come out, how far is the science, and the excuse, we will be certainly be in a position to export what we don't need and to give it to lower income countries. Both of that has not ha really happened. Uh, so we need to, uh, for a next crisis, and the next crisis will certainly come, uh, learn how to interact between science, the scientific community, the government, and to become better there. And the third message, which I think is extremely important too, and I think uh, has been alluded a little bit, all these topics have been extremely politicized and dividing. And there are all these fake news out. It is very difficult for you know, decision makers to understand where do we stay here, uh, what is fake news. There, I had a very interesting interaction now with the enemies of vaccination. And they're really uh, organizing a social network, a social movement, and can become very strong and very dangerous. And I think all of that makes me uh, realizing that we need to take this right to participate in science very, very seriously and profit from this crisis to push that. And that's the reason why uh, the UNESCO Commission of Switzerland has taken that as one of the priorities. I would like to thank Gerard and others who have actually participated in April on a seminar uh, on the, in the Geneva Human Rights Dialogue, and we will continue on that. The first thing is really to say, what is the narrative? What do we need to uh, tell the population about this? And uh, then from there to move on uh, further down the road. So that's the reason why I'm here, and uh, the reason why I hope you will support us in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will, I hope today we started to build this necessary narrative. As a Swiss, I'm torn between continuing the discussion and being right on time. So I will make a compromise. Does any one of you panelists have a burning sentence to deliver? Please do so. But you may. I, I have a burning sentence to deliver. 
uh, I would just say that in, in order, in terms of the specific context of scientific publishing that, 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 that I touched upon, I think in order, let's keep in mind, in order to be compliant with the spirit of Article 27, and in order to protect and to anticipate the problems that we're going to be facing in, in, in the coming years, we have to protect against misinformation. We have to have a knowledge base of validated, uh, of validated uh, 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 knowledge and that must be fully open. And there should not be any technical, financial, or logistical reason for this to be any other way. Thank you. Alexandra, yeah, you go first. please. Um, and I think that it is very important to acknowledge that um, science sometimes, unfortunately, the way it, outside a human rights framework, uh, contributes to maintaining structural discrimination, and this is it is extremely important to to create structures and uh, implement the human rights standards so that science um, helps um, the 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 uh, equal. Um, uh, equality rather than have the opposite effect. And, and I think that we need to reflect a lot more on every aspect of science and how um, it contributes to structural discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea? Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this narrative since I've learned myself uh, that this right exists and what is the meaning, how you can explain in, in one sentence what it is. And I, I'm still working on that. Uh, but one idea, uh, it's, uh, it, it is a framework for thinking about the, the social contract between science and society. Um, this is language that goes back to the 40s, but I think uh, we haven't really thought about that that much. So uh, to me, that would be one of the pillars of this narrative, to think that there is a social contract between science and society, which is, works both ways. Great. Thomas? Easy. Uh, please, those who are on the board of Chester, take this message back. The right to science should be also a priority of this organization. Don't forget about it. Take it as a priority. I'm glad to come back next year and hear you decided it to, it to be a priority. Thank you. Thank you. So the last word to, to Samantha. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased Andrea brought the 40s back because the normative structure of science, this is what we should be working on. In the general comment in 2020, the Committee on Economic and Social Rights referred to the need for a national framework law on science. And this is something we should work on domestically, at the Swiss level, for instance, but also internationally. We definitely need some strong legal normative involvement with science at the international level. Law doesn't need science so much, but science does need the law. And I think this is my, my, my takeaway message. Um, uh, and maybe a second takeaway message is you've heard us talking about the human right to science or the human right to participate in science. I think there's a lot of harm being done by repeating right to science rather than right to participate in science. And I think that we need to worry about the words. Words count. Um, so let's do something right about talking about the right to participate in science. Thank you. Okay. Well.